So you gave us so much to think about. Um, we actually, uh, because you were also busily answering people's questions, we don't have too, too many questions uh, queued up. Um, so if people uh, have questions that they haven't written already and they wanna raise their hand or just type their name into the, the chat, uh, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be in line uh, pretty quickly for, uh, for, for asking your question. Um, uh, Eliza Nobles, maybe we would, uh, would you like to ask your question about um, riparian uh, corridor planting? Sure. Hi. Hopefully you can Hi. see. Um, well, during the presentation, it was mentioned that um, there were some challenges planting trees along the riparian area um, and choosing species. So I'd like to hear more about that. And um, this was already kind of answered in the chat, but I was interested to hear about how specifically the trees um, are widening the stream. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, so uh, Eliza, I'll take your first question um, and to say that um, most importantly, it, it is to select the right trees and shrubs for the site. And we generally are using native trees and shrubs, in this case native to Pennsylvania, that are highly adapted to those floodplain environments. And so we have a, a short list of about 20 trees and shrubs that we use heavily. Uh, because they just are very uh, resilient in that floodplain area. We can use others and um, we're working to try to diversify our plantings, um, but those workhorse trees and shrubs do very well. And it, it's interesting to, as Claire was describing that, that inviolate buffer area right nearest the stream, that's where we want those those native trees and shrubs, including some really, really big trees, because deep shade with lots of leaves is critical. Whereas if, as you move away from the stream and look at perhaps some other kinds of productive crops, uh, you're going to be looking at hybrids. You're going to be looking at cultivars. Um, there's going to be more, more of a horticultural and agronomic approach to that part of the planting if that's integrated. Um, I'll just say that um, there are so many challenges. And if you recall the, the growth along the stream in that sunny section that was right behind me in the very beginning of the, uh, of the video, that was Japanese hops growing. That is a, a very aggressive vine that really wants to just take over the whole riparian area. And so it's an example of a new kind of plant. There are many others that have moved into this area of Southeastern Pennsylvania that really just love to run over and, and take over buffer planting if we don't control it. Dealing with deer browse, dealing with rodents like mice and voles, um, dealing with weed pressure is, is all a challenge. But that tree shelter, that tube, that plastic tube that we plant all of our trees in is, is an incredibly useful uh, tool to basically fend off all of those threats to the trees, but we've got to manage the site in a way that uh, those tree shelters don't become coffins. So uh, we can talk more about that if people have more questions, but thanks, Eliza. Thank you. Uh, Nick, Pastor, you want to um, raise your question that's aimed at the three panelists? Sure. Um, first of all, <clears throat> thank you all for uh, these wonderful talks and it's so nice to see them kind of talking to one another. Um, so one thing that runs through each of these presentations is the value of afforestation and ecological restoration around um, the streams in a watershed, or I really liked how Lamont put it, you know, powering up the bioreactor. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak or any of you could speak to the design challenges of this kind of adding of multiplicity of uses in a landscape. In a landscape. Um, especially for landscapes that have long relied on monofunctional approaches to land use. And so some of these multiple uses that uh, you guys pointed out, you know, grazers plus forest cover, food crops plus forest cover, production space plus public space, or the kind of uh, forests and wetlands or forests or wetlands. So what are the critical questions in terms of design for co-location? as opposed to questions of economics or questions of scale, if our goal is large scale implementation. 
I, I'll start out um, and just mention probably the biggest design challenge for uh, reforesting these floodplains in a farm context in Pennsylvania is that we're often dealing with livestock. And so it's not just so easy as laying out your rows of trees and getting them planted. We're doing that within the context of grazing animals that would love nothing else than to chew on a nice swamp white oak. So we've got to install fencing, which complicates things. We've got to install, in many cases, crossings that are typically at grade, like at the stream bed level, um, to get to get cattle from one pasture over to another without letting them get into the buffer, and uh, and that's that's typically a like a five thousand dollar in installation just there. Um, there there are some other design challenges, but I'll leave it at that because uh, dealing in a pasture context where we've got to fence out that buffer is the is probably the the most common and maybe more expensive design challenge we've got. I'll just jump in on the back of um, Lamont and just say that in our conversations with um, the Penn Vet Center uh, a year and a half ago, whatever it was, uh, they pointed out to us that they thought that there were benefits for browse possibilities with their uh, livestock, especially their cows, if they could be um, eating some of the coppiceable shrub growth uh, to supplement the grass, you know, if they could have access to uh, some of that sort of woodier material, shrub growth material. And so theoretically, if you have um, that section fenced in such a way that you can control access at certain times of the year, when it's um, less dangerous to let the cows in for a short period of time to browse, <laughs> you could actually um, have the cows go in and browse on some of that shrub regrowth and then remove them again and allow the, the shrubs to continue growing. So that's one of those um, sort of multifunctional, multi-use areas that could be used for multiple reasons, not just biochar, but possibly also browse. Um, if it's controlled in the right way, done at the right time of the year, so it doesn't sort of um, expose the stream to additional pressure. Um, I just say that I think some of the key takeaways from trying to innovate and develop new green infrastructure projects in urban areas has been um, kind of shifting the mindset that the first time that you do something, it's going to work and, <laughs> and um, you know, being able to be flexible and to pivot when necessary, you know, um, speaking, you know, Lamont was talking about various animals trying to um, engage with his landscapes. <laughs> and, you know, even in urban areas, like we had to fight with, um, with um, other animals trying to live in our monitoring equipment. Um, so I think that, um, you know, as Claire pointed out in her presentation as well, um, having pilots and then being able to learn from the first try and to innovate and understanding that it takes time, um, I think is something that uh, is a challenge, but it's also a really great opportunity if you can go in with that thinking. I think all three of the speakers referred to research and pilots um, to refine approaches to get the biggest bang for the, for the acre or for the buck. Um, and I, I think it'd be great to talk a little bit about how important is further R&D um, versus strategies for incentivizing large scale implementation. Um, those could be the kind of novel market mechanisms that, that uh, Claire talked about. Um, they could be policy changes. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, about where the the bulk of the work is uh, is needed at the moment, that would be great. Well, I'll jump in and say if anybody's got a spare couple of million dollars to do the R and D necessary to prove out our concepts, we'd really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> we've um, been working with people, grantees, uh, interested colleagues to continue to promote these ideas. Um, they are sort of supplemental to the work that we currently have underway in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative where we have 65 organizations working together across the watershed on an ongoing basis to do real on the land um, sort of 
um, land protection, ag restoration, stormwater, green, green stormwater infrastructure solutions. Um, we are looking actively, working with people, looking for opportunities to raise funds, to continue doing the necessary work to prove out these concepts in an R&D environment. Um, we've been working with the University of Maryland's Environmental Finance Center on some of that. Um, applications have gone into NRCS, um, the uh, Conservation Innovation Grant uh, rounds, looking for upwards of a million dollars worth of funding to sort of put into the continuing um, investigation of this work. So we are actively looking to try to move this conversation forward. Um, and we would recommend, you know, we would um, encourage anybody that has an interest in this space that would like to work with us on doing this work to get in touch with us. I would just say that um, we obviously need to continue to innovate um, just as an example, I have a colleague who's on the call today, Dave Wise. He has been looking at, at using gravel mulch around each tree as an alternative to herbicide. Um, it's just one small tweak, but if it works, we'd be able to reduce the amount of that chemical that's needing to be applied in this area. So we're, we're very interested in those new research questions. But we also, I think, need to recognize that funding innovation is maybe the more important thing here. And here's, here's just one example of, of, the, of the gravity of this problem. Um, for years, Pennsylvania and EPA have agreed that Pennsylvania is underfunding agricultural non-point source pollution reduction practices um, to a tune of about $350 million per year, every year. And that's just within the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is only half of Pennsylvania. Um, we're, spent, we're spending a mere fraction of what we need to be on what truly is water infrastructure. It happens to be taking place on farms, but it is water infrastructure just like Helena's technologies in, in the city environment. And so um, hopefully Pennsylvania will increase its funding toward <laughs> Uh, these kinds of projects, but I don't expect them to come anywhere close to that $350 million per year. And so we've, we've just got to find additional ways to bring more money to the table for this. Chris might want to jump in here and talk a little about the PenVest funding opportunities in Pennsylvania and the state revolving funds in particular. Chris, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll I'll just start by saying that uh, that you know I think part of the opportunity with uh, the new Bolton Center is is really creating. I'm sorry, I've got some ambient noise in the background, but um, uh, is creating an opportunity for for research kind of geared towards opening up new streams of capital to support conservation, to support best management practices on farms. Um, that that's a type of research that's a um, that's a or, or a category of research that that is um, uh, I don't know uh, you know could could use a lot of uh, focus that doesn't have a lot of attention being paid to it right now um, and it's a very f kind of high leverage form of research because it's the idea is um, uh, is to kind of um, uh, to study ways in which you could uh, to generate new, new forms of capital for Im implementing these practices. And so th that I think is part of the promise of the, the working buffer concept or promises maybe, a, a, I don't know, an aspirational word at this point, but you know, but, um, but the, the kind of idea of, the, of the, the working buffer concept is, you know, can, can you uh, introduce new st revenue streams to a farm uh, with uh, practices that benefit water quality? Um, that the kind of typical way that we approach uh, addressing water quality concerns in agricultural landscapes is through uh, um, uh, paying, paying for them directly uh, through sunk costs, through grant programs, primarily through government grant, grant programs. Um, you know, whether or not there's enough funding available, public funding available to achieve what we want to achieve ultimately is a, is a 
major question. And so there's kind of a, a lot of opportunity in this space of, um, of trying to understand whether or not there are uh, uh, business models that we're not understanding yet that could make it possible for uh, um, return seeking capital to enter the equation here to help farmers to implement new practices on their farm um, that also you know, improve the farmer's bottom line uh, in a quantifiable way. Um, and, and, uh, and I think you know, there's some research being done on questions like that, but it's, you know, it's a drop in the bucket compared to, uh, to all the, the research that's going into the, um, the kind of strong justification that we have for a lot of the existing government grant programs here. Um, yeah, I I'd just like to add that I think, um, you know, finding that money is, is always the, the challenging part, right? And um, one of the things that I think, um, I don't know that it doesn't necessarily help like you guarantee that you find money, but I think as we're looking at changing the ways that we've traditionally done things, making sure that we're talking to different types of people and new people that aren't in our in our designated normal group of professions can help. Um, so, you know, even with the curb research, going to a civil engineer and asking them to think differently about it, it starts to open up different pots of money um, when you start to have different types of collaborations um, and you can kind of put together grants in, in slightly different ways. Um, and then it also just helps, I think, uh, kind of raise the awareness of the issues that we all face. So we all, you know, there are many professions that look at water and we all look at it slightly differently. And so the more, the more we break out of those silos, the more kind of um, opportunity I think that we have to potentially um, widen the sources of, of funding that we traditionally uh, look at. For people who are interested in kind of following up on an elaboration of what uh, return seeking capital um, might might mean uh, in this case, um, Chris uh, and Claire introduced us to uh, Propagate Ventures uh, and Jeremy Kaufman, who I think is a speaker next next week. Is that right? So next week, uh, if you if you want to see a, a really good example. Um, of, of how you can go beyond just thinking of, you know, farmers earning uh, money from, from crops that they plant uh, in, in a buffer um, and to, uh, to elaborate that, that uh, return seeking capital idea, that would be a great talk to come into. Um, Mary, do you want to ask your, your question? Um, hi, uh, I was just wondering if there were specific problems at New Bolton Center that sort of spurred on this partnership with Stroud. Are there certain specific things that we're looking to solve at New Bolton Center? I, I'll take a first stab at that and then Lamont can jump okay. in. Um, when we went there to talk with them, uh, it was actually by way of a sort of personal connection of mine to someone, some people that worked at the New Bolton Center. Um, and we started the conversation and, and we realized it rapidly took off. Um, you know, our needs and their needs sort of overlapped immediately in around uh, the potential use of a manure digester. The fact that they have a stream on the property that um, probably needs some uh, additional work in terms of bringing it up to standard as a fully functioning riparian buffer. Um, so those were the two immediate needs um, that were like um, the overlap area for the discussion going forward. I think they're in the process of designing and building a new cow shed. Um, you know, the way that they do that, the way that they consider how to provide energy and um, lights and manure management for that facility really helped to uh, bring the conversation along. Um, so, you know, in many respects, I mean, the fact that they theoretically could have a working buffer on their property, since they ne need to improve the buffer there already, the fact that they have, they want a manure digester, the fact that they could introduce a gasification system, 
to work alongside a manure digester to uh, investigate this potential for biochar production, whether it be clean biochar or whether it be this mixture of biochar with manure um, uh, that comes out of manure products that come out of the uh, manure digester to make a long-term sort of slow release organic fertilizer that could be sold. Uh, all of those things are potentials and offer opportunities to really engage on working together as partners going forward and proving out some of these concepts. I think the biggest challenge we face actually is understanding the scale that this needs to work at in a watershed for it to become profitable. And that's, um, I don't know whether we do that through um, sort of fiscal analysis or whether we start by trying to demonstrate the concept and then sort of like try to figure out how to grow the riparian buffer, working buffer concept outside of maybe New Bolton to see how big it needs to get and what kind of rotational cycles and schedules we need to maintain the gasification system to you know, feed the machines, so to speak, um, and make the whole thing become profitable over time. But that's kind of the role of philanthropy at the end of the day is to sort of subsidize the investigation and subsidize it to the point where it can take off and become its own thing that's self-perpetuating in the future. So that would be the goal, is to get a group of philanthropies together to subsidize the investigation for it to eventually become its own self-perpetuating funding machine system. Cool, great, thank you. Mary, in, in general, uh, I think sort of the, the set of ideas um, that, that uh, powered this Farm of the Future uh, Dialogues uh, series was the idea that, um, you know, the, 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 the acreage at New Bolton is substantial. Um, and so, and there are many other parts of Penn that are interested in some of the research questions uh, that uh, Lamont and Claire and, and Chris and Helena have put out for us today. So the idea that there could be collaborations across the university also to set up, uh, you know, research plots there. Um, and that overall, we're, we're trying to explore with this series, not only how does um, the new Bolton Center become a kind of mighty uh, demonstration farm that uh, people can come, farmers can come and look at what some of these buffer implementations look like. You could see in Lamont's video, it was really nice to, to to see what we're talking about, um, but even more so to be able to come and, uh, and, and have a tour and, uh, and, and see what the results are for different uh, you know, test areas. And, uh, and so we, we are thinking always about the new Bolton Center, but we're at the same time thinking about um, all of the farms in the region. Um, so, that's why the speakers pay a lot of attention to um, things like, you know, what's the average scale uh, of, of agriculture and land ownership in the area. So there's kind of always a, a moving between scales to think about what if everyone did this, um, what would it take for everyone to adopt these practices? And then also thinking about what the role of a demonstration uh, farm at New Bolton might do to stimulate those larger scales. Just the only thing I would add to this um, is that I think um, the soil health movement is something that New Bolton can help lead in the area. We are talking about turning the cropland and the pasture soils into very, very effective, a, a very effective bioactive sponge. Uh, a lot of our a lot of our agricultural soils are not functioning to the, the degree they could be, and the effect on the water, uh, either running off the ground or or prickling through that cropland, could be so much more efficiently used under a, a healthier soil condition. And I think there's a lot of new things we could be looking at together to to tweak some of the the cropping and pasturing systems at New Bolton to really increase the functioning of the soils that underlie there. Yeah, if I could add, this is something that kind of ties together this conversation, part of the conversation from last week, um, 
because I know Stroud is involved in some research looking at the kind of intersection between soil health and stream health and kind of looking at how um, uh, uh, you know, healthy soils uh, behave or interact with, with water in terms of water holding capacity and infiltration rates and things like that. And, um, and uh, you know, and generally speaking, we're, you know, talking about, um, you know, soils that are good at sequestering carbon are, yeah. you know, so generally good at uh, managing water. Um, and, uh, and there's, you know, some, there's increasing evidence about, uh, and, and kind of research attention being focused on the uh, integration of livestock uh, in, uh, if, uh, in farming operations in, in a way that uh, is designed to improve soil health. Um, and, uh, you know, and that seems to be, uh, a, you know, a kind of uh, area of research that's of increasing interest in the world of soil health um, that, uh, that New Bolton could be a real leader in potentially. Um, Tom Daniels, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lamont, uh, both you and Claire, I'm sure, are well aware that Pennsylvania leads the nation in, in farmland preservation. And as part of that uh, effort, um, before a conservation easement goes on a farm, the farm has to have a soil and water conservation plan on it. So uh, on the one hand, there, it's a great opportunity to come up with money that farmers can use for better conservation practices. And I'll give you one quick example. The first farm I ever preserved in Lancaster County used all of its money to cost share with the Chesapeake Bay program to put in a, a new manure management system. So it, it was a win-win uh, kind of deal. Uh, so I guess, you know, a question I have for both of you is, you know, are the soil and water conservation plans that are being done for these farms that are being preserved, are they, are they adequate? Do they need to be more complete? Do they need to emphasize, you know, you know better barnyard management of, of water? as well as better stream management of water? I think the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, but I, I think there's a problem um, from what I understand anyway, from the, and I, I'm one step removed from the grantees that are actually doing the work on the farm. So Lamont can talk to this better than I can, but um, the impression I have is that many of those conservation plans are there uh, in paper form and sit on the shelf and are not actually implemented. So I think the first problem that we have is actually getting them to even implement the rather simple conservation plans that they do have. Um, who's paying for those plans to be implemented? That's a fundamental question, right? It goes back to the whole resource base of the whole thing. Therefore, you know, we've got to come up with better systems, better market-based systems that create perpetual funding in the system so that we can actually move implementation forward. But um, above and beyond that, sure, it would be lovely to have um, higher ambitions for those conservation plans. Lamont, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head that implementation is the key. I just, a plan is only as good as uh, the extent it's used. And uh, are there aspects of those of the farm that are getting left out of the plan simply because of how they're, how they're, uh, what they're required to address. The barnyard issue that you raised, Tom, is, is a huge one because, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different conservation measures we can, we can take on a farm, but fixing the barnyard, that usually means a lot of stormwater, uh, BMPs and manure storage integrated can easily run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet um, that, that may or may not be part of, of what is undertaken as part of a farmland preservation effort. Um, I, I think also a lot of plans are written to kind of be baseline soil conservation. Um, hopefully they're all written to meet the level of T or tolerable soil erosion. But our concern is that even that level of tolerable soil erosion um, may not be adequate for the water quality objectives that we need these farms to be delivering. So um, I'm, 
I'm much happier to be working with a farm that's preserved for sure, because we know that there's long-term investment as, as a farm there. Um, but I think um, getting the farm preserved is only the first step toward getting the farm uh, fully, fully implementing a set of BMPs that we need for the waterways. But a great point. And I'm hoping we learn uh, when we're dealing with the stormwater issues around the farmstead, I hope we're learning some things from the green infrastructure community, Helena, because you're, you, we are generally tied to practices that are in the Natural Resources Conservation Service Tech Guide. They define our world in terms of what gets engineered. And that's probably not always keeping up with some of the latest things you all are working in the urban environment. Yeah, there's plenty of places that, uh, you know, I mean, there's the riparian areas, but there's, there's a lot of other places within, within working landscapes for sure. Um, and cities, cities weren't doing it voluntarily. <laughs> They're not just, you know, putting green infrastructure everywhere for their own good. They were doing it because they didn't have a choice. Um, and so I don't know, I don't know where the tipping point is for non-point source pollution in that, in that way. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we clearly have a lot of challenges with it here in Ohio with uh, our extensive tile drain network that feeds into especially the Maumee River Basin. I mean, you have algal blooms there and um, they're, they're still adding more CAFOs in, into that watershed. Um, so that part is unclear. <laughs> I think Helena, your, your um, presentation also really gets us thinking about the legibility um, of these systems. So in urban context, we think a lot about how design makes these attractive um, and, and multitasking, but also how design can convey what is happening in the system. Um, and, and maybe that's something that you could imagine would be very useful, not just for demonstration farms uh, and university uh, campus operations, but uh, in, rural, um, in rural areas where you're hoping for adoption of these strategies. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we've, I've run a few studios where we looked at, you know, the, the idea of kind of uh, bringing some of these ideas to, you know, even just rural roads um, with a typical, you know, just a ditch on either side and utilizing um, some of those kind of sausages that you were talking about filled, <laughs> but you know, could you fill, uh, fill them with seed mixes or things to make them kind of productive pieces of infrastructure. Um, and, you know, it, maintenance is always a big challenge and trying to figure out how you maintain something at a scale that's um, much larger is always um, going to be a challenge. Um, and I think if you can make it legible where um, things are planted in certain ways where perhaps if something's happening that's not supposed to be, um, the, the, the way that it's designed can kind of inform you of that as well as alert you to the, that there's something different happening there. Um, Margaret, do you want to jump in with a question? Um, sure, thank you. First, I wanted to say thank you so much for all these presentations. They've been absolutely amazing. I've learned so much and there's so many ideas right now, a um, little bit of a, a buzz, but um, I did want to just throw it out there that, you know, when we're thinking about Farm of the Future as it relates to Penn Vet, you know, at the heart of the matter, we're a veterinary school and, you know, looking at all of these best um, management practices, well, speaking of veterinary school, excuse me, <laughs> my, uh, my daily visitor. Um, you know, looking at it from an animal um, centric and an animal health and a one health model. So looking at things like riparian buffers and, and swales and you know, different regenerative practices and how it benefits the, the health of the animal. Um, and also you know, the, looking at things like you know, soil health when it looks like using animals on the land as part of carbon sequestration and as part of you know, forage management systems. So you know, kind of flipping that and then also using all of your areas of expertise to really create robust opportunities for not only our veterinary students um, and researchers, but 
you know, the community, um, different farmers um, of the agricultural community, but also the Penn community as well. So, um, so thank you. And um, it's really exciting to get, you know, our, our animals, uh, you know, um, healthy and out there on the grass. I just want to elevate one of the comments in the chat box. Uh, someone mentioned the work that, that New Bolton has, has done um, in the area of animal nutrition and how it relates to water quality. That, I, we really hope that that kind of cutting edge research continues because 10 years ago, New Bolton was coming out with some new rations uh, that were really helping dairy farmers reduce the amount of phosphorus that they were feeding the cows and then were coming out the other end, um, that leaving farmers with excess phosphorus in their manure to have to deal with. And um, it's this, this issue, it just illustrates just how multifaceted this issue is. Yeah, we gotta deal with storm water, we gotta deal with buffers, we have to deal with soil health, but the animals themselves are such a critical piece of this whole thing and uh, precision feeding is, is, a, is a huge boost to the efforts, but on the front end, taking kind of a pollution prevention approach. Fantastic. Uh, Nick, do you wanna jump back in with a question? And, and if I'm missing anybody who would like to, uh, to ask something, just put your name in the chat and I'll call you. Sure, thanks, Ellen. Um, so uh, I don't know, uh, panelists, if uh, you were able to come last week, but uh, one of the panelists last week uh, for Carbon was uh, Ben Dobson, who helps operate a farm in upstate New York. Um, and he spoke in this like uh, incredibly poetic and powerful way about uh, the need to keep manure aerobic and really kind of keep it out of the water system in the first place um, and really kind of separating that nitrogen load um, and really dealing with this as a separate kind of a process. Um, and in some ways, biodigesters taking in the opposite direction and saying, okay, we can manage this inside of the digestion process and we can kind of separate these waste flows and make them usable. And so I'm just wondering if anyone has any thoughts on these kind of competing approaches, you know, is New Bolton Center an opportunity to compare approaches kind of at, you know, fundamentally different in, in, their, in their assumptions, um, trying to get a little bit deeper on their carbon numbers, on the kind of the hardware expenses, the saleable value of the different byproducts, um, and really kind of make it an apples to apples uh, comparison mm -hmm. for farmers that have very different needs. Yeah, I want to jump in on that because one of the things I took away from the presentation last week was that I really need to follow up with Ben. <laughs> um, so that was very good, a very good question. <laughs> um, you, know, I, you know, I take the point that uh, manure digesters may not be the perfect solution and may not be the perfect solution uh, generally or in specific circumstances. Um, and I would love to get with Ben to talk a little bit more about, you know, his... Um, his idea to sort of maybe not use manure digesters, but to use composting instead. Uh, I will point out, however, and I, it's a question that I would point pose to him, um, if you're doing composting outside, you're still getting um, gasification and off, off gassing of the composting process. It's just that you're not particularly aware of what is happening. <laughs> with that gasification process. In fact, I know from years and years and years ago when um, EPA was talking about uh, creating um, alternative landfills where they would basically have huge balloon systems over the top of composting systems to try to, and then, but to capture the gas, the gasification that's coming out of the composting system because they were aware obviously that there would be off gassing in the process and they needed to deal with that and capture that. Um, so even though composting sounds like a, an attractive alternative, <laughs> it poses its own set of questions. Um, and I don't know which would be better. Uh, I would be perfectly happy to go whichever was proven to be the better solution. Um, but you know, it's nice that we have a choice and we can maybe do some comparative analysis and figure out what the better solution is. And maybe it's a different solution in different locations. Who knows? Yeah, likely to be that also maybe it's a different solution depending upon the scale of the farm, um, which I would posit is part of the reason why we don't see a lot of biodigesters 
in uh, in the Delaware River Basin portion of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, if there is a, a, a where the farms are smaller than the than the you know across Pennsylvania uh, on average, um, but uh, you know, so if there you know if there is a, another option for uh, for um, uh, for managing manure for developing compost uh, that you know suits a smaller operation. Um, then, uh, then you know, it'd be great to have more options for because we have our farms are diverse. Actually, I just want to jump in again on a slight tangent, building off of that conversation. Um, I think part of what we have to do here, um, sort of, is implicit in the conversation to date, which is we need to solve things at scale. And part of the reason we haven't been able to solve things is because we haven't been talking about how to solve the scale problem. And many of the scale problems or many of the solutions that we've been talking about will require things like cooperatives, um, like the biodigester, like the gasification system, possibly like the carbon forest system. If we're going to use carbon as a way to preserve headwater forests, we need a functional co-op system to bring that to bear. Because when you're using 100 acre farms and 100 acre forests, we can't get to the scale we need to be at to um, have a system that's feasible and effective. So part of the challenge that we're all facing and the nonprofits are facing this too, is how do we work together more effectively in these co-op systems to solve these problems? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem of the East Coast in particular because of the parcel size that we have here relative to the size of the, the problems that we're facing. We need to get things up to the sort of financially feasible scale that we, you know, a challenge to solve these problems at. I think that's been one of the, the, uh, the things I've liked the most about this, this panel, that the, um, the emphasis really was on what are the barriers to, to getting to scale and how do you solve them. Um, is there anything that you, uh, sort of last words that you, you, you have for us, things that you think we, we might have missed um, today or that you want to put on our agenda for, for future dialogues? Great. Uh, we have not talked much about grazing today. And it, it relates to what Ben was talking about. It relates to the issue of of anaerobic manure. Um, in so many ways, a grass-based system, be it dairy, beef, or other animals, actually makes a lot of these technical challenges kind of go away. There's still plenty of resource concerns on a grazing farm that need to be addressed, but the system itself is, um, is a whole lot more sustainable with fewer best management practices needed. Um, and and for, so for New Bolton, I mean, I think this is, a, this is a really, really important topic for Pennsylvania agriculture generally. For New Bolton, as it's considering changes in the future, um, obviously it needs to continue to serve modern confinement-based dairy, which is kind of the bread and butter of, of Pennsylvania dairy farms. And it's just moving more in that direction. And yet there's also, as we know, a, also a very important movement toward grass-based farming. And can New Bolton also be serving farmers from that community and their research questions? Um, I know that you can't be everything to all people <laughs> and you've got to do a few things right, but um, can we integrate more grazing into even a confinement type of, of dairy operation and do it successfully while achieving high levels of production? You know, I think that's a a really important discussion for the future. Absolutely. In our farmer innovator session, we talk a lot more about uh, regenerative grazing. So that's coming. Any other last words? I really want to just say thank you for the opportunity to share the ideas um, more broadly that we have about trying to work together to solve these problems. 
um, so many people are doing really great work, but uh, you know, we need to work as a community to solve these problems. We can't do it in isolation. Thank you, Claire. Your, your leadership um, you know, on this subject is, is pretty incredible. You, you taught us a lot uh, and we thought we knew a little bit about this area. So uh, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Margaret, do you want to sign us off? Sure. I just want to say thank you very much for everyone. Um, you know, thanks for spending the time with us this afternoon and for your investment, your energy, and your enthusiasm for Farm of the Future. We appreciate it.